One second. Uno, I'm ready when you are. All set.
Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for being here for this Friday fireside chat. Uh, my name is Aaron Malkin, uh, he, him, his. I'm the literary director and dramaturg at the workshop. And we are so happy to have you all here today. Um, we're broadcasting this from Zoom and simultaneously live streaming on Facebook. Uh, thanks for spending a little bit of time with us. Um, this fireside chat and all of the virtual programming New York Theatre Workshop is doing uh, is free for the entire community in the hopes that it is a community that we have had and a broader community um, when we're not confined to geographic location. If you're in a position to support the work, uh, we would really appreciate a donation if at all possible. Um, you'll find a link to donate in the chat if you're joining on Zoom or in the comments if you're joining on Facebook. Uh, the conversation today will last around an hour. Um, our Education Director, Alexander Santiago Herrao will ha uh, moderate 40 minutes of conversation with our uh, esteemed panel, and then we will open it up for Q&A. Um, if you have a technical or logistical question, uh, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom or write in the comments on Facebook Live. Um, and when we get to the Q&A portion, you can use that Q&A uh, feature to set, submit questions. If you are on Facebook, um, please feel free to write questions in the comments and they will get them over to us on Zoom. You can also use the upvote feature on Zoom or the like feature on Facebook so we can try to get a sense of the questions that are most burning in the audience's mind. Um, I think without further ado, I will now introduce uh, Alex to introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, and I'll see you back in a little bit. Thank you, Aaron. Hello, everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to invite our panelists to come on and I'll introduce them really uh, uh, briefly um, and let you all know that we're also putting their bios on the chat feature as well so that you can read all about uh, their uh, wonderful uh, work lives, professional lives, and art. So uh, we have Helea de Barros, who is uh, a director of arts education at Arts Corps in Seattle, um, and Michael Road. I'm I'm seeing around around the screen. Um, uh, artist, founding artistic director of Sojourn Theater and a professor at uh, uh, Arizona State University, Shobaka Kavana Kuduil, who is the director of the graduate program in educational theater at City College, um, and Daphne Sikre, who is a professor at Loyola Marymount. University. So we're also thrilled to, to have you all for this conversation. As Aaron said, this is going to be a uh, uh, 40 sort of or, or so uh, moderated panel conversation on the topic. Um, and then we'll open it up for conversation. Uh, we are so thrilled to have so many of you um, joining us. And we know that we have artists and educators uh, from all parts of the country um, working in many different areas. Uh, from, you know, uh, K through 12 education to college professors to community-based practitioners and facilitators to teaching artists um, and arts administrators. Um, so we, we, we are going to try to make this conversation as inclusive as possible uh, of all of you, uh, but know that we're all in this boat together trying to figure out how to adapt our practice as best as possible. Um, to the, the, the current situation. So this is hopefully going to be a conversation about ideas, a conversation about um, resources, um, and a conversation about how we can sort of learn all together. None of us are experts in, in what this, um, uh, this transition is, uh, but it is really about um, being in conversation together. So I just want to welcome all of you. Um, that are joining us from home and joining our panelists. Hello, everyone. Let's try this down. Can we hear all each other? Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello, everyone. Fantastic. Um, so I just wanted to sort of quickly start by, by just sort of, you know, speaking of the elephant in the room, I think a, 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 a lot of folks that are, um, you know, in our field, teaching now are sort of asking themselves this big question of how do they um, adapt um, what primarily for all of us is an embodied practice dependent on human, you know, um, to human observation and interaction, 
um, and sort of the whole body and whole body involvement to to something like this. Um, and I just wanted to get your sort of um, your, your initial impressions of what 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 are you doing in your practice now? How are you reflecting about this transition in your own ways? You all teach in different forms um, and in different contexts. So what are the first things that you are um, you know, doing to adapt your practice um, in your teaching. So um, I'll, I'll go around the circle. So, so Michael, I'll start with you in terms of, of what you're reflecting, what you're doing, and then I'll go around. Um, uh, hey, everybody. First, um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be uh, on this panel with this amazing group of people. Um, and those of you who are at home and quarantine, just I want to make sure I start by wishing you health and safety and hoping you and your loved ones are doing all right, um, both in the physical pressures and traumas of this moment and the incredible difficulty for uh, so many in so many different ways. Hope you're okay. Um, and thanks for joining today. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about in the spaces that I'm in, um, I guess three main things, compassion, listening, and imagination. Um, so thinking about starting whether I'm uh, with students or whether I'm virtually right now working with community participants and residents through one of the projects I'm working on or whether I'm helping doing the ongoing work I do through the center that I'm a part of uh, with capacity for partnership and collaboration in communities. So I work a lot with folks in government and municipal settings and community development and public health spaces. So in all those spaces, thinking about how are we starting uh, from compassion how are we uh, creating equitable opportunities to listen to each other? Um, and how are we foregrounding the power and potential of imagination, both to get through the hard moment we're in, but even more importantly, to turn any kind of theater or community or education or justice space into an opportunity to very tactically work on imagining how we use this moment as a potential for transformation and change uh, and justice in whatever spaces we're in. So that's a starting place for me. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I wanna echo uh, what Michael is saying is that we're doing um, a lot of listening. Um, we work primarily in the K-12 setting um, and with many different community partners. Um, and uh, we're very much still in the throwing spaghetti against the wall phase of like seeing what works. Um, and that's, that's, that's involved a lot of listening to our students and our youth to hear what they need and want and what platforms work best for them um, and what um, kinds of lessons work best for them. But also a lot of listening um, and talking with parents and families and our community partners. Um, you know, I think we really, first and foremost, it was about like, how do I keep my teaching artists employed because they are the, the, the bedrock of all of the work that we do, um, right? So that was the first thought that came into my head um, when all of this started happening. Okay, schools and programs are closing. How do I keep my people working? Um, and then it was really like, well, well, what do we do at Arts Corps? Um, and, and how do we now deliver that in a different way? Um, and I think the thing that we keep coming back to is we do relationships really well. So how do we do relationships through video, through phone calls, um, and through distancing? Because that's not some that's not a way we've ever done it before. Um, but but reminding ourselves that it's it's really all about that, right? So um, and the foundation of theater really is all about empathy, right? So a lot of listening, a lot of empathy, and maybe throwing out on the window what we thought we were going to do, because that's not actually what's important right now. Yeah, Shoba. Um, I've been doing a lot of, I mean, compassion really speaks to me, like checking in with our students. I primarily work with graduate students and a lot of them, you know, are on their own living in apartments by themselves or with roommates and they're sort of isolated in their bedrooms all day so that they can continue to do whatever it is they're doing without interrupting um, their roommates. But I think checking in um, and kind of making sure they're all all okay was a big one. Um, I think flexibility is the other one, both in sort of tossing out my syllabus, but also just in the moment. You know, sometimes you have a plan and just people's moods weren't there. Um, you know, what is the relevancy 
of what I intended to teach you and what's going on right now. And I think what's going on right now is just, you know, listening to that is modeling kind of teaching to the heart, um, which I think is really important. And Daphne, your, your thoughts on, on the moment? I want to echo what everyone is saying, um, the importance of compassion and listening and imagination and flexibility and keeping people also working and all of those things put together. Um, I think as educators, uh, especially theater educators, artists, we think about those things. Compassion is right here in our hearts. It's part of the work that we do and, and what we love and share. Um, what I've realized with my students, I teach predominantly college students, but I've also been advising and working with teachers and helping teachers go online and helping create programs and things of the sort. And um, for me, it's been a lot about, okay, first I need to include my students in this conversation because I cannot be creating programming without them. Like if I don't have the information from them, I don't know how to create programming for them. And the same thing goes, I was talking to a theater and about their teaching artists and that's exactly the same thing. I was like, you have to bring in your teaching artists and have a conversation with them. You can't just, so it's also about inclusion, um, which I think is really important. I have, um, a student, she was working on a research project and she was presenting it in a symposium and she had written a play with some of her classmates. This is last week. And she had to do a presentation, you know, like this. So she's like, what, how do I show my play? And I said, why don't you gather some of your friends and, and do it on Zoom? And they did. And within two days, they rehearsed it, practiced it. And it was, it was amazing. And what was beautiful about it is that then she said, she's like, I've missed acting. We, we, we miss acting. And it was just so moving. And I was just like, well, we need to find, now that we're stabilizing in a way, it's been a month for some people, it's been two months for other people, you know, how do we give back the things that, you know, artists love and how do we create these spaces to continue this art form that we love? But at the same time, um, be really informed. And I just recently started doing a lot of research on trauma-informed critical pedagogy and just seeing, because a lot of, whether it is, you know, a young kid in first grade or whether it's a college student, a lot of people are feeling this is incredibly traumatic for them. Yeah, thank you for all that. Yeah, and, and so what are some of the things, what are some of the strategies that you have been experimenting with um, in your own teaching to use these digital tools um, to sort of shift pedagogy, not to throw away your curriculum necessarily or throw away your syllabus, but to adapt it to the moment. And as you're saying, meet the, the needs of your students. What are some of the strategies? What are some of the things that you've, you've been doing um, to, to adapt to this digital tools? If you're doing a face-to-face -face, um, sort of synchronous lesson, or an asynchronous lesson where you're not, you know, where you're sending information. What are some of the strategies? Anybody? Um, well, one thing I've been doing is really trying to switch my thinking and encourage my grad students to switch their thinking and look at this as opportunity. Um, so, you know, let me give you an example. I teach creating an ethnodrama class and they not going to get to perform their ethnodramas. Um, we usually have a big end of the year event and celebrate the graduates, but sort of giving them the moment to grieve that and then thinking about, we had a really great class and discussion about what can we do? How do we take our research and perform it? Um, and they came up with ideas and made lists and then gave them, you know, one of our class classes, I just gave them time to um, touch base with each other and to see what they had the capacity to do, what they felt comfortable doing. Do you want to read it live on Zoom? Do you want to record it? Um, you know, so what spoke to them? And they came back with some great ideas. Um, but I noticed that it took me, um, when this first happened, you know, I, I was kind of put in this position of trying to be optimistic for everybody and would kind of close my computer and just cry. Um, and so I, I realized I had to give them the opportunity to kind of grieve with me and like figure it out, and we did. Um, but it took a little bit of time to 
look at it and really switch our mindset to like, how, how do we look at this as opportunity? And now they're really excited because we can invite people across the country, across the world, you know, um, it'll be easier for people to attend. Um, and, you know, we had a really great class. They got their scripts down to about 15 minutes, which is what we asked. And then somebody was like, you know, can we do a talk back like we usually do? And I didn't, it didn't occur to me that they don't want to. Um, and so they're, they're coming up with great ideas, but you know, I think it was really important to give the space to, like we talked about, listen, um, and then also just kind of keep in the back of my mind, what was the purpose of this class in general? Like, what did I want them to come out of there with? And they've done their research. Um, so that's a tactic that I use, just kind of that, flipping my mind to think about opportunity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Michael, I know you've been thinking a lot uh, about collaboration and you've been posting some YouTube videos as well. And, and I'll get to Daphne's ideas too as well. Yeah. You're on mute, Michael. How embarrassing, sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, I started with that list, compassion, listening and imagination. And I think because as a theater artist, um, I tend to be interested in big um, subject matters. And so I often make lists or I, I sort of create buckets or territories for myself. So I, I have a starting point. So I've been doing the same thing, thinking about um, this time of change and transitioning a lot of work into this environment. So for me, it's helped me to think about for territories and I've broken it down into collaboration, story, voice, and values. And I find the opportunity in this moment in lots of different kinds of spaces that sort of, I mean, I feel like any artist, not just theater, uh, those are four areas that are extremely relevant to be exploring. And sometimes when we educate our students, um, we actually don't always spend as much time as I think we could on collaboration and values in particular. And when I say voice, by the way, I mean the individually unique perspective voice lived experience that that individual artist creator brings to the world. So it feels to me like there's this opportunity, whatever the class is to bend it and use the opportunity for um, this close up is so intimate and incredible in terms of what it allows to happen. And this frame is such an incredible box that you can like, my example lately has been, you know, here I'm me and all of a sudden there's something theatrical going on because I'm still there. So it's like, you know, how can you explore the ways that, that, that any of those things can be investigated? Um, and particularly questions about collaboration and values feel so powerful and necessary and urgent in this moment. So I really like taking the time to sort of come up with exercises, asynchronous and synchronous, that invite folks to think about those things in relation to their experience and their sense of purpose and their beliefs and their um, perspective on the world. So, so story, voice, values, and collaboration have been one way I would think about breaking down tools in this moment. Yeah, thank you. Daphne, yeah. I like thinking of um, mediums and um, using the students' mediums also. And like one of the first things I started thinking when I was revamping, um, how do we go from one to the other? You know, like how do we go from this like live, touching one another, being in the same physical space room to this virtual room and boxes? And um, I was like, well, students are doing performance on their social medias and so I've also been sort of exploring that and really talking to people about utilizing that because then that creates these worlds and these spaces. Um, going back to your original question Alex I was looking um, with my students I had two check-ins before we started classes which fortunately my university gave us this, a week to prep we had spring break and then we had an additional week to prep which is wonderful wow. so doing that week to prep I had um, yeah very blessed because um, not everyone had that opportunity. Some people had to literally go online the next day. Um, but I had the opportunity to be able to check in with my students and see what they needed. I am teaching this semester script analysis. So it's not a performance class. But my script analysis class is script analysis for human rights. And so I had some plays on that list that were very heavy. And so one of the first things my students asked, mm -hmm. they said, is there any way that you can find social justice plays that are not 
so heavy because mm. we, we can't right now. And so I really looked at the place that they had left for the semester. And I was like, okay, let me take these two out, which I know would be the most traumatic and mm. let me replace them. I, I went on forums and asked different people. And then I found like two that I was like, ah, this one looks at that perfect. And it fits in the sequence. And this one looked at that and fits in the sequence. That'll work. Um, so again, this inclusion and this listening and talking to the students being so important. And then um, being a script analysis class, they were supposed to do a, use all the different analysis that I had presented to them for one play. But instead, I decided to flip it and switch it. And I said, I was like, why don't y'all write a play? that looks at human rights. And so the encouragement that I'm having them do right now, and in conversations, I asked them and they were like, yes. Like, because it was a way for them to voice how they're feeling and not having to do this analytical, they've been doing the analysis all year round, like all semester long. And they were really excited. And then to give them an incentive and motivation, I've started looking at competitions and organizations that are looking for plays right now to do on Zoom. And so some of them are gonna be submitting plays. And so they are creating work as well. And so I, to me, I, I couldn't be more happy and more proud of them. And they were really excited. And when I proposed doing, you know, I was like, well, why don't y'all submit to this, for example. They were like, oh, you know, this excitement. And- An opportunity, yes. An opportunity yeah. for their yeah. creativity. Yeah. Um, any additional thoughts, Halea, in, in, from, from your work with teaching artists? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the, the, the benefits of the work that we do is, you know, we're not necessarily um, tied to any sort of grading system, like in a college or a high school class, you know, and our, our, our goal really is always to ignite the creative power of young people, right? And that comes from social emotional learning, that comes from starting from a base of growth mindset. Um, so that's really the foundation of everything we're doing right now. I think um, one of the positives that we've really found um, in in moving into this digital, digital space is to really like center the artist back in teaching artists um, and 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 focus on them as performers um, some of the the best videos that we've created have been our teaching artists performing themselves because they're very talented and our youth don't always get to see them in that way. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we're going to be launching um, again is like, you know, our, our, our teen youth um, don't want to come to live classes on Zoom, but they're on Instagram and TikTok all day long, right? So, um, so we're, we're launching like Instagram live series twice a week featuring, again, our teaching artists as artists and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and many of our other like high school youth also as artists. So just um, as a time for like, um, you know, the, the art, the, that's what we're, a lot of us are doing for distraction right now also is just consuming the arts in that way. Um, and then um, again, you know, our, our teaching artists are just doing a really good job of, of, of listening to what, to, to what families need. And that's not going to necessarily be like trying to figure out how to do an improv game on Zoom. It's going to be like, everyone has a sock in their apartment. Let's do sock puppets. Um, let's do that stand up comedy thing because that's easier to do on your own than it is for me to figure out how to like, you know, pass the Zoom around the Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, just, just looking at different formats about uh, what youth just have access to themselves and, and what they want and need. And that isn't always forcing a class to come together. At, or when we're coming together, maybe it's like only for check-in because that's what we need right now. Yeah, yeah. So sock puppets on TikTok. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Tons of it. There are so many teachers that are on TikTok now. I mean, I, I didn't join until all of this happened either. And now, of course, I'm obsessed and I'm on it all day long. So following that, any other ideas for sort of teaching acting or directing um, and, and, and using these digital tools and their capacities and their opportunities and, and, and fun um, ways? You know, I made, I made a video about, um, it was an interview with my friend Jessica Thebus, who's an incredible director out of Chicago. Uh, and it was basically looking at toy theater or object theater as a way to really aliven an investigation of storytelling in this box. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's on the YouTube channel that we'll share as part of this, but basically just thinking about if you're exploring directing in particular or writing or dramaturgy or analysis, sort of what you can look at in terms of what happens in this box. It's an amazing opportunity to actually really think about um, focus, relationship, 
uh, plot story. And I, I think that's a, a great way to explore that. I think a lot of people are exploring acting, certainly just in terms of what the potential is to look at film performance here. Um, and that's powerful. I think from where I sit as a maker, I'm interested in the frame more than I am just about the tools of the individual performer. But I think lots of people are doing such great work in, in both those spaces. Right, yeah. yeah. I'm really excited about um, two things. One, the sort of like resurgence of radio plays. And, you know, that hasn't happened in, in, in a long time. And, and people turning to podcasts also as a way for the imagination. And it, that to me, it's, that's so exciting to see that um, because the form has been there, but not that many people have been utilizing. So now all of a sudden people are like, oh, I can still direct but now, you know, I can still work on directing the, you know, intent, form, objective. I can still work on directing, you know, delivery. And I don't need this visual box to direct all those things. Like, and radio plays provide that format to be able to do that. A good radio play, listen to it, and you are seeing what is happening. And so that's really exciting. Um, I'm also really excited about the 24-hour a, a play project that's on Instagram. And um, I have all of, you know, colleagues of mine that are playwrights writing these monologues. And it's A, exciting to see like my friends who've written a monologue. And then B, exciting to see like these mega superstars doing their monologues that have really been, again, designed for this box. And, and you watch these and I'm like, we're gonna have all this material. This is insane. Mm -hmm. And it's just really, it's exciting. Um, to see the creativity and to again, like rethink, right? So it's not that we can no longer teach theater. It's like, how do we adapt theater to teach it in this new form? You know, how do we come up with ideas or if we, and I think the biggest struggle most of my colleagues had was like, how do we teach scene study, right? Mm -hmm. And so again, it's like, okay, we have to sort of like push aside how we've been teaching and rethink like new, new, new forms, new ways, new art. And we're artists, like all we need is an idea. And then all of a sudden our ideas will grow. Mm -hmm. I think too, it's, um, you know, oftentimes we're creating theater in a classroom and we have to use what resources and what architecture and what, what is available to us in that moment. And I, it's the same concept for me, what is available. Um, and that's what I've been throwing back at our students like what is available what can you use what what I mean I we've been using talking about objects and sound um and just spending some time taking those objects and creating sound um in addition to just you know the visual but really revisiting that idea of how do you use sound as part of this artistry yeah I, I've also been hearing for some from some colleagues that you know this is a time where you you know going back to what you were saying Daphne of scene study that you can focus on table work as well. Uh, and as uh, students are uh, preparing for their own scene work, and there's ways in which you can uh, hide other people on Zoom and just have two actors, and we can focus on just those two actors. But before all of that, uh, people are, are focusing and sharing their preparation and the notes that they make on their text, which, which is a very interesting thing sometimes to, to to Michael's earlier point about collaboration, that's an element that we just skip over and we're not sharing our table work, we're not sharing our preparation in our scene study. Um, so this is a time to do more of that uh, as well. And one, another wonderful feature that I'm, I'm learning, all of us are learning is that in the scene study portion, students can change your background and, and then you can inhabit new locations as part of your class and part of the scene work. So there's a design component as well. Yeah, I also, um, something that we've been doing with um, some of our, our teen youth too is, is this is really an opportunity to talk about what it means to be a self-marketer and self-producer um, mm -hmm. and, you know, how to, to build your following um, on Instagram and TikTok and online and how to uh, self-edit and self-produce self-tapes, how to do voiceovers from home, um, things like that. Because, you know, there isn't a way to survive in this business without knowing how to do that anymore. Um, so now that we're all stuck at home, it's a great time to uh, to be looking at that. And what does it mean to build a brand? And also like, which of the theaters are doing that best now too, you know, like 
New York Theater Workshop has managed to keep programming happening in a different way. It's different kinds of programming, but um, but programming is still happening, right? So like, how how are different people responding, right? Williamstown is putting all of their plays into audio plays this summer. Like, um, how are people still making it happen and and looking to see sort of who's getting that attention? Yeah, I love that idea. Thank you for that, Hale. I love that idea that you can open up your lessons as well to uh, bring in um, other professionals in the theater for panels and conversations. Can we talk about the casting process and can you invite a casting director into your classroom? Um, you know, can you talk about actors as dramaturgs and, and invite a, a professional dramaturg for that conversation? So there's so many opportunities as well to, to focus on the career development of our students along with their, uh, the development of their craft. Um, uh, you've been talking a lot about um, uh, student engagement um, and, uh, you know, one of the, one, and compassionate as well, but I wonder if you can talk about um, what, what are the ways that you are also um, assessing students? One of the, you know, the things that uh, teachers are becoming nervous about in this, in this you know, uh, climate is, so how do I teach the students, but then how do I assess them digitally? Have you, have you thought about any of that in your practice? Mm. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, I think a, uh, a lot of conversations I've had with people, some people are like, I just want to give them all A's, um, which I understand. And at the same time, and then there's also, there's some districts, I can't remember which one, so I think it was maybe New York, no, in California, they said it was like, you know, LA, they were like, no kid can fail any of their classes. Um, I think there's, it's a tough one, because especially in the college setting, like there are grades. Um, my university has given the option for students to take sort of a pass fail if they wanted to. And so then it's up to the student themselves to choose that option if they want to. So then for me, it's a, is it a completion of the work? Then you pass and, cause, and then that makes it easier. For those that don't take that option, I, we talked with my students and I said, I was like, do you want me to create a rubric? And they said, yes. And so then I presented the rubric to them and I asked them if there was anything they wanted to change and they were okay with the rubric. So, you know, again, having them and being, having them part of the conversation, I think is really important. But I also think that we need to acknowledge um, that some of our students don't have the accessibility to do some of these projects and to do some of the things that we are asking them to do. And so I have a student who does not have a computer. And so they are a college student and they do not have a computer at a university that is a private institution. So again, like the assumption that everyone is going to have accessibility. So he's been logging in via his phone and doing his assignments on his phone, which is amazing because the person's still doing the work. Like they're doing their assignment, they're doing, they're using like Google Docs on their phone to do their assignments. Um, and so you have to think about those things. And so I think that also with assessment comes the notion of like, it's not just assessment for everyone in the class, but it's also assessment for those who don't have the accessibility. So are we also providing asynchronous opportunities for those students um, who we are have to grade because our system is telling us we have to grade and, you know. And they can't access a face-to-face -face class, but there's other ways to do it. And to be flexible, and that goes back to some of the words that um, some of us were saying, um, Shoba, I think you said, you know, flexibility. And so again, if our, our students, they don't even have this medium, right? Like, how are they going to do this? So even when we're coming up with projects and ideas, how to make sure that we are still including them? You know, if, if you have one young, you know, student of yours, and they live in a one bedroom with their three brothers, you know, and sisters, and their mom, like, how do we help them still be able to create and assess them for them to be successful? Yeah, yeah I, I did a lot of, um, you know, invited them into the conversation. We, we also were given um, a week to rethink our syllabi and our courses. Um, but I included them in the conversation. I went back and said, here's what I'm thinking. And then when it was time for to look at these assignments and create a rubric, I really 
you know, I said, this is what I, this is, let me articulate to you what I want you to get out of the assignment right now. Um, and here's the rubric. What do you think? Does that seem doable? Do you all have the capacity to do that? Um, you know, I think that, that moving forward, this is going to be a new normal, but I don't want to dismiss the trauma that's, ha you know, with the, the suddenness of all of this. Um, and so I think, you know, I think this semester, um, I want to be flexible and, and be really cognizant of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love what you're all saying that even though we are in this format digitally or we are sending out assignments um, via email or, or Google Docs or whatever it is to, to, for accessibility purposes, that we're trying to still make our lessons as engaging as, and participatory as, as possible, that that's a way for us to keep the nature of what we do alive. Uh, you know, what are the ways in which we can use these digital tools to, to keep uh, students engaged and participating and in dialogue with each other? Uh, so you said not, something that's, that's, yeah. um, that I, I've, been, I've been thinking about and working on it sort of through a scaffolding. When you first said, how are you assessing? I didn't think you meant um, them as a student. I thought you meant their well-being. Ah. And, and so I want to say for, the me, above. Yes. For, for me, there's four things. The first thing is I have to assess their wellness. So that's, that's my primary first thing relationship wise, their wellness. And then I have to assess their capacity to participate. And again, that comes after wellness, but is related to wellness, but it also includes having a computer or not. I had a student who, when we went to zoom, he was, I don't want to say embarrassed, but he felt awkward about saying why he was on the phone. And so I connected with him afterward. He didn't have a camera. He couldn't afford a camera. He had a really old computer, didn't have a thing. So we, you know, we got him a, a camera. Uh, and then the, and because there was a way at the university to be able to, to be able to get him a camera that he could access. So after that, so wellness, um, capacity to participate, then there's attention. What attention are they putting on the work we are doing together? And by assessing that, I can determine both, I might have to go back and talk about wellness or capacity to participate, or it might just be like, hey, why aren't you putting more attention on it? Because you're not, and it's okay, just talk to me. I need a relationship there. And then the fourth thing is output. Like, what's their output in relation to the goals or intentionalities of this experience we're sharing? We may not get to output in the spring of 2020, and that is totally fine for me. And, and that is the sense I get in all the environments I'm in. Nobody is saying to me, not, they're not saying don't be rigorous, but they're not saying um, you have to be really uh, intensely strict about output. It's really the first two that are most important and then trying to support the second two, attention and output, to try to make some learning experience for them in these moments. But number one and two are sort of all that matter right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that reflection. Um... Um, and reflective practice. So I want to open it up for questions because I know that there's lots of people that have lots of questions. So folks, you can use uh, the Q&A feature and we have this nifty tool that allows you to uh, vote up questions. So I'm going to try to uh, go through some of these questions for our panel um, and uh, you can jump in. Uh, there's a question here for Halea. Halea, you mentioned uh, some great ideas you're using with uh, your teens. Um, any tips on working with younger kids? Um, yeah, you know, I, we've, I've actually been really surprised at, at the reaction with younger kids. I thought for sure um, they would not have the attention span past 10 minutes on, and like that we would never get them to sit on a Zoom call. And in fact, they are the ones who like love sitting on Zoom more than any of our other ones so far. They're the ones who show up and they are like, entertain me. Um, so that's been surprising and not at all what I thought. And again, you know, you have to listen to your youth and students. Um, the sock puppets has, has been something that we've been doing with younger students. Um, some of my teaching artists with those younger grades are also, um, recording like podcast audio recordings of stories. Um, and then like leaving the end off and having the students come back to the session and saying like, what ending did you come up with? Um, we're also, um, doing a lot of mask making both like 
practical masks that you need to wear outside, but then also like fun designs on them, like make your mask that you have to wear outside an animal. And then how can we be um, doing that and engaging in that in class? Because then it's, it's something that continues on past the time that we're together. Um, and is again, you know, um, we're really focused on how can we be engaging these youth um, who, whose parents are, are working from home or, or, or maybe are not working from home and um, they're at home with siblings or aunts and uncles or cousins and things, right? So um, giving them engaging opportunities uh, like that. Great, thank you. There's a question here on how are you planning uh, seasons, if it's you know in college or your, your own classes, how are you planning if, if, if we don't, get to go back to normal, um, going totally digital? Anybody? I mean, I'm, I have, I have to put some more thought into this. I'm just trying to get through this semester right now, <laughs> but I am going through the process of slowly accepting that this is our new normal and that maybe we won't be um, a full semester online, but maybe, you know, hybrid classes are going to be um, something we have to really start thinking about. Um, and so I think what I'm going to take some time to do when the semester is over is really look at all of the courses that we offer and what can be taught online, what needs to be done, you know, sort of when we're in person, um, how, to, how, to, how to think of a quicker way to, to shift things. Um, but I, I do think that this is going to be uh, an, our new normal for a little while, at least you know, even if just half the semester's online. I, I think, um, I, I am pretty convinced that we will be online all of next fall. That's what I'm hearing in lots of spaces. I don't think universities will be going back to school or at least most, certainly not large ones size-wise. Um, so I'm planning for an online fall. Um, and in that context, I'm thinking about what are the courses I and a couple of my colleagues can create new work that really focuses on some of those things I talked about earlier, um, values, voice, um, story and collaboration, but also how can we help students? Because here's what's gonna happen at the universities and I imagine everybody on here is thinking about this who's in those settings. Most students are gonna contemplate and most parents are gonna contemplate gap years or gap semesters understandably so. So I think it's our responsibility to make experiences that are worthwhile and that can be narrated as worthwhile on the front end so students want to come back and we give them uh, safe spaces and productive spaces and just spaces that are both helping them think about their life in these fields post this trauma and also just giving them a place to be creative and imaginative uh, in these moments and times. So we're thinking about classes that provide that. And in the work I've been doing with high school educators and middle school educators lately trying to be supportive, um, I'm really suggesting that folks think about their fall purely as making and production spaces, not as skill spaces. So when your students come back online in the fall, if that's the case, make something with them. Make things that can exist virtually, make for this format and give them a space to tell their stories give them a space to connect with each other, give them a space to connect with and engage with their communities and other residents so that this becomes um, a place that they want to be in um, where they can both create and share connection. So I'm thinking about those things. Yeah. Um, for us, um, we haven't started discussing because we haven't heard that we're moving into the fall online, we haven't started discussing that possibility. We have a season that we had already picked. Um, we were looking at utopia dystopia as our theme, so quite appropriate. <laughs> um, and so we haven't had those conversations yet, but we have started having the conversations of like, do we start getting e-certified? Should we start thinking about how our classes <laughs> might be hybrids or fully online? Like in case and addressing that sort of gap year, because I've had students bring this up and say, I'm like, well, you know, maybe you can take one or two classes so that you're not missing out. And maybe you can take those classes online. Um, and so we're thinking of like, how can we start transitioning to moving some classes that we might not have thought about online to online so that our students who might be thinking of taking a gap year can still be taking those classes um, to not, you know, fall back on their coursework and things of the sort. But I think that, that um, that's, a, that's a, it's a tough question. And I think a lot of places don't want to address it until the, you know, order comes that says this is what's happening. 
Yeah, there are a lot of questions about um, the ways in which we can use this digital platforms. You know, what's the you know an ideal number for uh, participants in a class, and sometimes, of course, that's determined by your roster. But um, what uh, what are some examples, um, uh, Michael? For example, in terms of uh, particular examples of how of an activity where you can use that sort of screen that you were talking about, that screen format, somebody's asking. Um, I mean, one simple example of that activity might be um, uh, take the day's newspaper and put students into groups of three or four and have them to take advantage of Zoom breakout rooms, give them 15 minutes and ask them to take a single news story, give them longer if you have it, and ask them to find a way to tell that story within this box and give them parameters related to what you're teaching. They have to use, they can use the written word three times. They can use three tableaus using objects, not people. Uh, use music. Um, and finally, use an image that they've printed out or that they've found. And somehow they have to tell what is most important or essential about that news story or that article in the box using those tools. And they'll instantly be thinking about, you know, dramaturgy and economy of image and sound and density of layers and th th so that's one example but you can extrapolate that in so many ways if you're working on a play take a scene from the play and don't use people <laughs> use sock puppets i mean i you know has anybody seen the katherine hahn video going around that's um glenn Gree, glenn ross done with american girl dolls i mean oh, yeah <laughs> that, that's basically they don't use this box they film it like a regular film but you know take whatever play you're doing and pick pick the objects in your home that are analogous for you in some way to those characters and like do the scene um, and use the box as a, as a, as a frame. And I think there's an endless amount of ways to sort of play with that. Great. Um, in terms of uh, student engagement and student attention, some folks are asking about how you might uh, uh, keep folks engaged. I know that one of the things that it's recommended and sort of best practices for online um, teaching is that you condense your content, that there's a different expectation between seat time in a classroom and the attention span that people have um, online um, and in the intensity of your spending your time online. So any ideas on student engagement? No. Oh. that um sorry you, i've noticed that um about 40 minutes my col my college students are pretty good with online synchronous and then what i started doing was breakout rooms and that was like another world it was amazing breakout rooms was incredible it was interesting like when i would if we were doing a, a lecture discussion where the students are talking not all of them would have their cameras on and not all of them um they just they're there they're present and you, if I ask them a question, they will answer, but the cameras are on. I emailed them privately to find out why. And some of them, you know, there's certain things going on at home they don't want to share. Sometimes that some of them feel personal, some of them don't have cameras. So a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, and then one of the reasons that I heard from a lot of students was they're exhausted of being on Zoom all day long. But for some reason, when you go into those breakout rooms, whoosh, all these cameras appear that were not there in, you know, 40 minutes before. And I'm seeing more work being done amongst themselves as peers and them supporting each other than the other work. And so I love jumping in from one, you know, breakout room to another breakout room. And it brings me so much joy to see them because I'm not seeing them in the other portion. And so I think that that's one of the things. Um, and I saw that people are sort of wondering like the ratios. I'm teaching about 15 students, so I'm very lucky, very blessed. Um, I, but I've also been, I've also taught 30 on Zoom and that works pretty well. So 15 is fantastic. Um, 25 to 30 is doable. I think anything past like 35, 45 starts getting a lot harder because then you have to like flip through the pages. There is other software that's not Zoom. I can't remember its name where you can have literally all of the boxes. That's just too much. It's, it's, it's too much. It's very hard. It's, it's, it's just really hard. But those breakout rooms. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, there's some, some questions uh, going back to this whole notion of assessment, output versus learning. Um, 
uh, and some folks are wondering how how do we uh, you know showcase student learning um, that it's not uh, uh, you know uh, output focused. And sometimes, you know, in the midst of standards, in some cases. Can I actually ask the panel a, a related question to that? Because somebody was typing about that. My sense is that in many places, standards are being put on hold for the semester, particularly at the middle school and high school and elementary school level, that there won't be testing related to those standards this year and that it won't affect funding to school districts and that it won't affect students being passed up. So. I'm curious, where are people finding they have to stick to standards? Uh, and, and what is that pressure? Is it real? And what is your experience? Because I think you all are in that conversation, maybe more than I am in a couple of your spaces. I mean, I can say that, um, you know, most of any assessing that, um, that, that we really need to do is for uh, grants and funders. Um, and so that, that has taken, um, I mean, that's most of what me and my executive director have done over the past month is have really intense conversation with most of our funders in terms of like, how are you going to allow us to A, redirect funding, um, be flexible about deliverables, um, and then also just like ease up on like, uh, I mean, I'm turning in numbers in terms of engagement that are literally like, how many Instagram likes did we get? Um, how many people added us in stories when we post a writing prompt? I mean, it's just totally different kinds yeah. of engagement. Um, the biggest assessment for us is like, uh, is attendance, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean showing up to the Zoom, but like, can't have I actually gotten a hold of each one of my students this week? And that might have just been through a WhatsApp conversation or a phone call. I mean, a lot of our teaching artists are just going back to the old fashioned phone um, and, and checking in and seeing if students are, are doing the work. Um, so that's coming down to where our assessment is. I can say in Washington State, though, that um, they are um, the, the state superintendent is saying you must give letter grades. Um, so um, in terms of like teachers um, in schools, um, each district is doing something different. So we work in three different school districts. They've all come up with different grading models. Mm. Um, uh, folks are asking as well, any thoughts about movement and voice classes online? TikTok. <laughs> also, I mean, I, I have a lot of friends of mine who are personal trainers and there is, a t people are doing a tremendous amount of movement. So, um, you know, that's not a movement class, but um, I have friends of mine who are dancers, who, um, who former students and friends who used to teach at like Broadway dance studios, like all these like dance studios, they're still holding classes. And let me tell you, people are jumping into those classes and some of them are paid, some of them are not. And they're, they're doing it. And, and I'm seeing people joining that. So I don't know. Helena, you, you wanted to share something. Yeah, I mean, I've, I haven't taken a ballet class in more than 10 years and I've take, I've been doing it like three times a week on Instagram Live. There are so many options on Instagram Live. And, and that's all movement. So if, if we have these dancers, if we have these uh, physical um, trainers, we have these athletes doing these classes, that's all movement. They're doing it. We, we as theater educators can, can also do it. It's just, where do, how do we how do we motivate people to join us and how do we create the spaces? And it's been really fun to watch people move their entire spaces around to create that open space for people, you know, to be able, even in a tiny apartment in New York city, I've been seeing a lot of my friends in their tiny, tiny apartments still making it happen. I, I also want to say, I just put something in the chat. Um, so at ASU, Liz Lerman, the choreographer and myself, have pushed ASU to make some of our online content available for free right now. So I just put in a link and if you go to it, it is an incredible batch of Liz Lerman tools for movement educators to use in your classes for free. There's videos, there's lessons, there's frames, there's ways of thinking. It's quite beautiful. And I'll also put in a link. I've got a ton of stuff I've offered around community-based and partnership work and listening and values. And that's all free and accessible as well. But because the movement questions come up, Liz's stuff, click on that and enroll. It's free and there's really great stuff there. And folks, uh, I just want to share that um, at the end of um, 
the panel, uh, you'll see a survey come up. Please fill that survey. Um, we will collect some of these resources and send out to folks um, over email. So if you register for the webinar as well. So, um, so we have, uh, uh, including Daphne, created a, a big Google Doc that has gone somewhat viral that has links to many resources, both in terms of content and uh, delivery of instruction. So uh, we'll share all of that as well uh, with all of you. Uh, Daphne, they were asking what, what, are, what are the two plays that you uh, uh, introduce in your syllabus? The, uh, could, do you want to share the, the name? Yes, so um, so we they worked really well. I was really excited. Um, we had just read To the Bone by Lisa Ramirez, and she came into class and actually, like, which is another wonderful thing about the fact that we're in this world uh, virtually, uh, I, she, she offered to come in and talk to the students, and I thought that was great. And so I was like, well, how can they get another perspective of looking at working in factories and um, looking at sweatshops and things of the sort? And I was like, real women have curves. And so that, and it resonated so much with the students because the main protagonist, um, she's from LA, she's from East LA. She, you know, her mom's working um, as a seamstress, like the whole pressures and the students really enjoyed it. And that, that was really exciting. So that was one of them. And then the other one, which they're reading right now and they're loving is Barbecue um, by Robert O'Hara. And he loves it because, I mean, the students love it because it's looking at race. And, um, and so they, they are really like, it's, it's a way of looking at race and still be able to laugh, but then be like, holy, <laughs> you know, and it hits you. And so those are the two that, um, you know, cause it's hard. Like how do you do social justice and comedy? It just doesn't happen often. <laughs> and so to try to find something that was lighter, those were the two ones that I substituted. Um, originally I had, um, uh, Necessary Targets by Eve Ansler. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's a heavy one. And then so I took that one and put in um, Real Women Have Curves. And um, and so, you know, the substituting was important. And I and my students are very they were like, thank you. Thank you for not having an ending that, you know, thank you for giving us plays that have endings that we can look at. But still, we can talk about the social justice issues. Uh, folks are asking as well, are there any um, uh, uh, tips that you would get, recommendations for asynchronous classes in terms of projects or lessons or activities that students can do on their own? I want to say that I think a really um, important thing to consider around the distinction of asynchronous and synchronous is if we're talking about the class entirely works asynchronously or we're saying the meeting might happen once in a while synchronously and their asynchronous work happens in groups synchronously and that's a real big difference i think with performance and any of the different ways we might explore it can groups of three get together a couple times and the rest of it is happening individually or are we saying alone they work only alone on their own time so just to say that those are two really different ways of thinking we even have people call i have people calling each other and sort of doing assignments on cell phones, person to person, and then one of them takes it on to sort of do the making and sharing that back to the group somehow. You know? We have so many questions. There's no way we're coming to the end of our time. There's no way we can answer all of these questions. Um, but uh, we'll try to share some resources from the panelists. Um, we'll include Daphne's um, uh, Google Docs, um, and then a host of other websites as well that you can access for content um, and delivery of instruction. And there are so many uh, wonderful links as well in the Association for Theater and Higher Education page and, and a number of others. So we'll, we'll share those resources as well. Um, you can our emails on there too? Oh, you, we'll share your emails if you want us to as well so that folks can contact you um, directly in your own, in your own, um, uh, organizational emails. Alex, I was just going to say, I was like, yeah, if anyone needs to uh, contact myself and I'm seeing everyone else nodding as well, please reach out. Um, for myself, I'm not going to speak for anyone else, but if y'all, if someone needs me to come into a classroom and speak to you or if someone wants to call or schedule or 
anything of that sort, bounce ideas. Sometimes all it takes is sitting with someone and bouncing ideas. And then all of a sudden, again, like I said this before, like the ideas just come natural, but I'm more than willing um, to give my time. I'm home. It's possible. So if you need me, <laughs> you know, just let me know and I'll definitely help out. She has a tortoise. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Any final thoughts from all of you folks? Somebody asked a question on here about joy. They said, do you think joy is important in this time? It's something we should be working on in our classes. And yeah. I just want to lift that and say, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and I think just remembering too that we're, we have a strong community, the arts ed community, and we're, you know, I think we're lucky to be theater educators, um, really privileged and, and, you know, reach out to people. I think people like are really generous with their time and like sharing um, the time to have a thought partner. Thank you. Anything else? Anything else? I was going to say, uh, folks were asking about radio plays, uh, podcast, uh, again, an opportunity for students to create podcasts. So there's so many tools out there. Um, so we encourage you, we're going we're gonna to share some of those tools. Um, uh, but thank you so very much for your time. Um, and uh, it feels like we can continue this conversation for hours. There's so many questions that we couldn't get to, um, but we will share some resources with, with folks. Um, and above all, I hope that people are using their creativity and experimenting with the tools and seeing uh, digital tools as opportunities rather than obstacles. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for hosting, Alex. Thank you yeah, for hosting. Thank you all for your time. Thank you all. Welcome back. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. This was a really tremendous conversation. I'm so grateful for all of your generosity. Um, and there were over 300 people watching. Uh, so it was quite a crowd, people I think from all over. So thank you for being with us in virtual um, community. I wanted to talk a little bit about some upcoming programming we have. Uh, we're having master classes every Monday uh, at three o'clock Eastern time between now and the end of June at least. Next Monday, Lilian, director Liliana Blaine Cruz and designer Adam Rigg are talking about their collaboration. And the following Monday, uh, Dito Van Riegersberg and his drag persona, Martha Graham Cracker, are uh, gonna be leading a class on performance. Uh, fireside chats uh, like this are gonna be Wednesdays at five. Uh, next Wednesday, Martha Redbone and Aaron Whitby, two beautiful um, composer, singer, songwriters, and the following Wednesday, uh, our Tao playwright in residence and playwright in residence, Victor Cazares, and uh, Theater Me Too artistic director Ruben Palendo on collaboration and being in residence at New York Theater Workshop. Um, and as I said at the beginning, all of this programming is free to the entire New York Theater Workshop community, wherever you may be. Uh, if you're in the position to make a gift, $25, $10, $5. Um, everything that you may give will help us through this crisis and beyond. We're able to compensate the folks who are participating in our programming and have retained our entire staff, including our administrative fellows. Uh, so we would be so grateful for any gift that you could make. Uh, you can make a gift on our website. And as Alex said, um, there's a survey that will pop up in the chat on Zoom and will pop up in the comments on Facebook. If you leave your email, we'll get you these resources that uh, everybody has been so gracious about sharing along with the folks' email addresses. Um, and you can just tell us how we're doing and what you're thinking about. Uh, so thank you all again for being with us, you the panelists, you the audience. Um, and we look forward to seeing you back virtually soon. Until then, please uh, stay healthy and safe. Thank you all. Stay safe. That was fun, friends. That was great, Alex. It was really fun. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for Thank sharing. You, Alex. We'll stay in touch. Share the recording when you have it. We'll love to share it with folks. It will be available on Facebook. Okay. Great. Awesome. Bye, friends. It was really nice to meet you. Yeah, yes. nice to meet everybody as well. Stay safe. Be well. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Adios, Alex. <laughs> <laughs>